nephew, who is an atheist, said, Uncle Steve, how could God have allowed my mom, my sister, to suffer so much in her life? These are the kinds of questions that people will ask us, and we need to be ready to give reasonable, rational, intelligent answers and biblical answers. So what about the character of the apologist? Back to this verse again. Be ready to make a defense to everyone, anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that's in you. However, do this. What are those two words? What's the first one? Gentleness. The second one? Respect. Whenever we are engaging somebody in apologetics, giving them answers, no matter what they are saying about Christianity or about God or about Jesus, we always address them with respect and gentleness, remembering that that person has been created in the image of God just like us. Here's another one. The Lord's slave. Yours may say bondservant, but in the Greek it actually is the word slave. We are slaves of Christ. Our, our master is a very loving, gracious, gentle master. But the Lord's bondservant, the Lord's slave must not quarrel. We don't argue but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach. That means we're able to use the scripture to explain the truth of Christianity and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. There's another great two verses for describing the character of the apologist. Colossians 4, 5, and 6, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making most of the time your speech should always be gracious. So third point, what's the difference between evangelism and apologetics? What's the difference between evangelism and apologetics? Let's look at some of the differences. Evangelism is telling others the gospel. But apologetics is defending the truth of the Christian faith. So one is just sharing the gospel, the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But apologetics is then just defending the truth claims of Christianity, which is much broader. Second, evangelism is telling one specific message. One specific message. The good news about what Jesus has done in order to save sinners. So evangelism is sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel. But evangelism, or excuse me, apologetics, addresses everything from the existence of God to the reliability of the Old and the New Testaments. Now, until recently, I think this is accurate, until fairly recently, there's not been much question here about the existence of God. But yet, through the universities, there are professors coming out of the West, out of the universities in the West, who are bringing with themselves atheistic philosophies. And that is going to be presented, start being presented and perhaps is already being presented in some of your universities. I know it is in, in East Africa because I've got an article uh, of a testimony of a young woman who is questioning Christianity and even religion, and it's because of what she's learned in the university. Evangelism is simply telling others a message about Jesus. That is something every Christian even the brand new Christian should be able to do. We're all to give our story. We're all to share our testimony. We're all to let people know what Christ has done for us and then also how they can know him and why, and why they should believe that he's the Messiah. Apologetics usually, but not always, requires some level of intellectual sophistication. I want to stop right there. Jesus said in the great commandment, you know that, what's the great commandment? Love God with all your 
talks about your soul, your strength, your body, and your mind. We need to think about what it means to love God with our mind. We need to learn how to think through the truth claims of Christianity and how to explain that to others. And that's what seminars, conferences like this, and classes that you can take help you to do that. It can, not always, it can involve logical arguments, historical debates, philosophical discussions, intellectual disputes, and more. That's not something that every single one of us may be called to do. But every single one of us is called to be involved at a local level with people in our church, our neighbors, to be able to answer the common questions that most people are asking. Now let's look at the link between evangelism and apologetics. The two are very closely linked. Apologetic conversations, and we'll talk about that in a moment, can lead to good opportunities to share the gospel. Maybe somebody asks you a question about God or about Christianity or about Jesus or about the the reliability of the Bible. And so you start answering those questions, but as the conversation progresses, you move them in the direction of being able to share the gospel with them. So apologetic conversations can lead to good opportunities to share the gospel. Evangelistic conversations will... Whoop, there. Evangelistic... Oh, it's back. Thank you. Evangelistic conversations will often lead apologetics to apologetics when non-Christians respond to questions or criticisms require a seasoned response. In other words, you may be out with a friend, with a neighbor, with a family member, and you start sharing the gospel with them, and they'll say, wait a minute, how do you know Jesus rose from the dead? Wait a minute, how do you know Jesus is really God? And so that's how sharing the gospel sometimes will then require giving an apologetic answer to a question before you can continue on with a gospel presentation. So what is the bottom line? What is the summary of all of this? Apologetics should not distract us from sharing the gospel, but we should also work to be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks us about the hope that is in us. We do not want to elevate apologetics above evangelism. Evangelism is already, is always the primary goal, the primary ministry to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. But as we're doing that, there will be times we'll need to answer questions. Now, this is a, I believe this is the most important thing that I'm going to have to share this morning. How to engage in conversations with dedicated tools and strategies in mind. As I said earlier, apologetics is changing. Apologetics is no longer just giving a lecture or saying, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says. Apologetics is now moving into a conversational type of style. And that's what I want to talk about. How to have conversations. Priority number one is learn to listen well. Learn to listen well. James wrote, My brother, my dearly, dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to what? Quick to what? Quick to hear. Slow to speak. And slow to anger. Every single individual wants to be heard. Every individual wants to be understood. And it's our responsibility to listen, to hear, 
to understand before we even start the discussion. So learn to lesson, listen well and move towards understanding of what that person truly believes and why they believe it. And once you are convinced, and once they are convinced that you know what they believe and you know why they believe it, once they're convinced that you know, now you're ready to start the conversation. I heard one man say on a podcast that he says nothing for five minutes. And the person who was interviewing him said his rule was to say nothing for the first 10 minutes. Just ask questions and listen. So what's the nature of a good conversation? There must be a willingness to listen. Ask, making sure you understand where do we differ on this topic? What exactly do they believe? What is it that I believe the truth is? Make sure that you truly understand that difference before you move forward. Why do these differences exist? How do you find that out? You need to find out their source of information. You need to find out where they heard it. You need to find out how they've come to that conclusion. And so we ask questions, we ask questions, we ask questions to really try to understand what they believe and why they believe it. Now here's a warning. The temptation is to listen, but while you are listening, to be thinking, here's how I'm going to refute it. Here's how I'm going to con con or contradict that. Or how this is going to be how I'm going to respond. If that's what's going through your mind when you're listening, you're not listening well. If you're listening well, you are strictly, completely trying to understand the other person. That's all. Pursue mutual understanding, then move into assessment. Now, what do we mean by that? That means before you get into a serious conversation, make sure you know what they believe, why they believe it, then help them understand what you believe and why you believe it, now you're ready to move forward with the conversation. Understand why the person has a different opinion, concern, or priority. Apply active listening, that's what I've been talking about. Understand why the person has a different opinion, concern, or priority. And then apply active listening. And that applies for any situation at all, any situation at all. Let me give you a very extreme example, but it's very appropriate for the United States at this point. If you're following the news, which I think most of you are, you know that the LGBT movement is very strong in the United States. So what do you do, what do I do when we might come in contact with an individual who is transitioning or wants to transition. Do you immediately rebuke them? Or do you ask them, why are you doing this? Just help me understand what's going on in your life, what the background is, why you thought you wanted to do this. And just be sincere about asking them their story and listening. And let me say at the same time, those of you who are parents, and looking at your ages, most of you are probably parents, if not all of you, that your children need to be listened to. If your children come, start coming up with some very strange ideas that they've heard from a friend, or maybe they've heard at school, whatever the source may be, don't immediately start lecturing them. Have a conversation, listen to them. Let them tell you what they're hearing and, and what that's causing them to feel and think before you start trying to correct them. 
and tell them what's right. Maybe say, stay away from that. Again, they want to be heard. So listen for a while before you get into your assessment or your correction. When discussions become challenging, become more curious as to why the person thinks differently than you. And do not assume that you know. So just be very honest with your questioning, very authentic is a word that the younger generation likes to use, and just let them talk, make sure you understand why they think differently. Let them speak and receive their responses as the sincere. They may come across as being very insincere, disingenuous, don't assume that. Assume that every statement they are making, they're sincere in what they believe and what they're saying. Do you, do you see the pattern here that I'm trying to develop? Try to get to understand them. Really listen well. There's a saying, maybe you've heard this, maybe not, that the others don't care what you know till they know that you care. And so the first part of the meeting is just to demonstrate, I care about you. And how do you do that? By sincerely asking questions and listening to the responses. Avoid dismissing what is being said by assuming a negative motive. Again, don't try to read their heart. Only God knows the heart. So take what they are saying as being sincere, that they really mean, mean it, and progress from there. Be curious. Ask questions. Not to defeat the other person, but to move toward mutual understanding about why you disagree or where the, dif where the differences and tension points are. Let's go back to the beginning of that, not to defeat the person. Remember in these discussions, these conversations, it's not our goal to win the argument. It's not our goal to win the argument. Our goal is to win the person. And you do that by listening, by having a relationship, by showing respect, by being gentle. Remember that Jesus, the scripture says, was filled with what? Grace and truth. As we are having conversations with these individuals, we need to demonstrate, along with the truth, grace. Work to understand before asserting. Learn to accurately paraphrase in the difficult moment in a way that assures your conversational partner that you understand them. So somewhere along the line in the, in the discussion, you may say, now let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. Here's what I hear you saying and repeat back to them and say, is that what you're saying? I want to be sure I truly understand. And they may say, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Or they say, no, you haven't got it yet. Then tell me again. Help me understand exactly what you're thinking, what you're feeling. So work towards that to where you, they know, they know that you understand them. Recognize that it's possible to move towards someone and yet, uh, yet disagree with them. Remember James. So what this is saying is, in your relationship, you can move closer and closer in that relationship even though you have tremendous disagreements because you want a strong relationship so that you can keep the discussion going. We always want to keep the door open for further discussion. So what that means then is in our first discussion with someone who has questions, who maybe isn't a believer, maybe in that first discussion, we're not trying to bring them all the way to the gospel and all the way to the salvation. 
Maybe all we're trying to do is just to get a conversation started, let them think about it, and we come back later and have further discussion. So always work to keep the door of the conversation open for further conversations. Here's how you sabotage a conversation. Making a confession and a quick pivot by saying, yeah, I know, that's, I know that may be true, but your side is worse. Don't use emotionally charged terms. Oh, that's a stupid, stupid to say that. Or something like that. Assigning motive, we've talked about that. Refusing to acknowledge that our side has problems too. We got problems in the church. We shouldn't deny that. Be a gardener. What does a gardener do? A gardener sows seeds. Sow seeds. Sow seeds. I like what one man said that in his conversations with people, all he's trying to do is what he calls put a rock in their shoe. If you've got a rock in your shoe and you're walking around, what does it do? It hurts. And it bothers you all the time. And he says that I want to ask good questions about what they believe, why they believe it, so that when they walk away, they're going, hmm, that was a good question. And they're thinking about that because that rock is in their shoe causing discomfort as they walk away. Stay on the offensive by asking questions. When they ask you a question, turn it around. Say, well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that question? Help me understand where that question is coming from and why you're asking that question. A lot of people, most people, have not thought about those questions. And so we want them to start thinking about why they're asking the question. What do you mean by that? How did you come to that conclusion? What are your sources of authority? And be sure to leave the door open for further conversations. Some examples. Let me give you two quick examples and I'll finish. <clears throat> two of our grandkids, well, one of our grandkids and her husband was part of that 70% that walked away from the church at this point. And so we had a conversation, maybe it might be two years ago now, and I just wanted to hear why. And they were expressing reasons. I think that he was, he was uh, influenced by the science teachers at the university. And for her, she's a very emotional young woman. And she has a hard time believing that God is who the Bible says when he had Israelites kill Canaanites in the Old Testament. Isn't that genocide? And how could God send anybody to a fiery hell and make them burn for eternity? And so I just said to them, you know, you're part of that 65, 70%. We are? Yes, you are. And one of the big reasons is because we're being told the younger generation was told what to believe, but not why to believe it. That's why we need to be telling the younger generation why to believe it. And they said, really? And I said, yeah, you go home and ask your parents why you should believe Christianity is true and see what they say. And my grandson-in-law said, I know what my dad would say. What? Because Jesus changed my life. Well, that may be true. But a Muslim could say that Muhammad changed his life. Or Jehovah's Witness could say that their religion changed their life. So we need to have more than just a changed life to demonstrate that Christianity is true. One more, then I'll we'll close. Many years ago, and this goes back 30 years, almost 30 years, I had a TV show. It was just local in, in our part of the city. But it was an apologetic show. And at one time, we were discussing creation compared to evolution. You know, there's a, this big thing in the universities that God didn't create it. It was just the universe came into existence naturally. So we take phone calls, and a, and a man called and said, I don't believe God exists. I said, okay. 
I was going to say, if God existed, do you think he could create the universe? I said, do you, if God exists, God doesn't exist. I said, I didn't say he existed. I said, if God exists, God didn't exist. I said, okay, let me ask you a question. Here's what I'm thinking. That it takes matter, energy to create the universe and space someplace to put the universe. And God created all of that. That's what's in my mind. So I asked him this question. Is matter eternal? No. Is energy eternal? No. That's what he was saying. Is space eternal? No. So I said, here's what you're telling me. Nobody created everything out of nothing and put it nowhere. And his response, I just know God doesn't exist. See, it was an emotional thing. He hadn't thought about it. So learn to ask good questions. And all of us are faced with these in different ways. How does it strengthen our faith? Christian apologetics offers a strong defense for the truth claims of Christianity, the origins of the universe, what it means to be human, truth about finding the meaning to life, what's wrong with the world and how do you fix it, truth about future and eternity, truth about the accuracy of the Bible, truth about Jesus, truth about other religions, so training in Christian apologetics can be great value for the life and the health of the church because as you are seeking these answers to share the answers with others, it's building up your faith because you're seeing that, that the truth claims of Christianity can be defended. And so that will make you stronger in your faith, but also it will instill within believers a deep confidence that Christianity is really true. So one is more likely to share their faith, less likely to abandon the faith for some of the pressures. Final word, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? But Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So apologetics can help answer questions, but only Jesus can save. So that's what it means to be a Christian apologist. Thank you. Um, let's jam our hands together once again. That's a wonderful one from um, Pastor Steve. Um, we pray that God will continue to um, save you for a generation and um, for his kingdom thank you sir so we are going to because of our time actually so we're going to the next presentation um by pastor ebenezer afolabi you can come up sir thank you thank you thank you very much god bless you okay um okay, can you please help me put up my slide Good afternoon or good morning to you all. I want to appreciate you for coming today, and I believe we, we are going to enjoy this moment together. Uh, my focus this morning is going to, uh, yeah, thank you. Here we go. Is how to do Christian apologetics from the African perspective. That's my concern. Um, Steve had laid a background um, telling us what it means to be an apologist, what apologetics is, the relationship between it and, uh, and evangelism. So I, I want to see how we can contextualize apologetics so that um, uh, it can make a lot of sense to Africans. Okay, but before I continue, I'd like to briefly tell you about um, a program that I'm putting up, and that is Introduction to African Christian Apologetics. Um, this course is available at Udemy, so that's, that's the link down here. Udemy is a 
a website and an app where you can learn a lot of things. So I put up this course there for those who want to have a kind of knowledge on Christian apologetics, especially from the African context. So I enjoin you to please consider this because it's going to help us a great deal. Okay, thank you. Let's continue. Now, being apologetics in the African context, what about it? First of all, I've always advocated that for apologetics to make sense to Africans, it must be context sensitive. In other words, it must appeal to the recipient. Or, we say this way, if it must make sense to Africans, it must consider the realities of Africans. That includes their socioeconomic realities, their sociopolitical reality, their sociocultural realities. So what am I trying to say? If you agree with me, Africa is a continent that is ravaged with poverty, bigotry, insurgency, kidnapping, bad government, a whole lot of things. And so, if apologetics must make sense to us, it must put into consideration some of the issues that we are facing on the continent of Africa. Uh, but I would like to start with um, some issues that we may not be dealing with on the continent. Um, Steve, look at apologetics from the Western epistemology. In other words, some of the things, you know, like uh, atheism, things that, that have actually led people away from the Christian faith. But for me, I believe that um, atheism, let me start from there. I've always believed over the years, and that's what I've taught over the years, that um, the traditional African tribe, in our African tribe, there are virtually no atheists in the traditional African tribe. You know, in other words, it will be difficult for anybody to come up and say there is no God in Africa. Isn't it? If at the moment you raise that issue, your parents give you a knock on your head. Where are you coming from? You know, so what I was discussing that with Steve on Thursday, saying that is my belief that uh, among the traditional African tribe, we don't have atheists. But he told me, he said, watch it. You need to start preparing for the future because your younger ones, your, your young people are exposed to Western education. They go abroad to school and then they encounter some professors who doesn't believe in God and they, they feed them with some of these things and they bring that back to you here. So in the future, you may be surprised to have uh, the, the upsurge of atheism even in Africa. And yesterday during our... Um, informal meeting, um, Rakure Dela, when he was calling my attention, he said, yes, we have atheists already in Africa. We have a lot of them, people that are denying the Christian faith, that are denying the existence of God altogether. You know, and uh, I was like, yes, come to think of it, there are some atheists there, uh, I call them uh, Bible scholars atheists. They know so much about the Bible. And uh, so, when you try to engage them, they will tell you whatever you want to say about the Bible. We know that already, so we're not going to go that way. And some, they are just angry atheists. They are just angry with God. Perhaps, at some point, um, they try to appeal to God over certain things, and uh, God doesn't come through for them, so they, they decided to just back out of this God thing. You know, some of them, um, like one of the issues that are taking people away from the Christian faith is the problem of suffering and, and evil. You know, like I was discussing with Steve the other day, I said, uh, we we're talking together. How, how would you try to convince a woman who kept a chastity all her life? Uh, she wouldn't do mess, she wouldn't mess up her body, she wouldn't do any one of those wrong things. And uh, yeah, yet she's married 20 years into marriage, no issue. And yet, a lady of an easy virtue, a, a lady from the red light district. Is having children surrounding a table. How do you explain that? A woman of one loses hers to sickness and she begs God, seriously, God, don't take my child. Just spare this child for me. But the child died all the same. But the, the woman having so many contemplating to use one of our home for money ritual. How do you explain that? So for that reason, some people come to the conclusion, there is no God. So, but we said, that may not be a serious issue here at the moment, but we need to begin to look into that. Now, the second 
issue that may not be really serious on the continent is higher criticism, you know, because uh, Africans don't usually think conceptually, we think concretely. So this falls into the purview of conceptual philosophy or worldview. We begin to think conceptually, does the Bible, is the Bible accurate and things like that? Who wrote this word? Who said this statement in the Bible? So this may not be serious issues on the continent. Uh, then secular humanism may not actually be a serious issue. Let's go further. Postmodernism, though we're having the effects on the continent of Africa already because people are challenging a whole lot of things. Um, for instance, according to Bond's law of relativism, he said, all truths are relative and they are subject to the perception of an individual. So whatever is true to you may not be my truth. And that is happening right in the church. Some people will tell you, please don't judge me. This is my truth. That may not be your truth. And that is the spirit of postmodernism. The spirit that says there is no absolute truth anywhere. All truths are relative. Now that comes, you know, in a kind of clash with Christianity because Christianity insists that truth is absolute. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. I am not a truth. I am the truth. But postmodernism says, no, there is no absolute truth anywhere. Truth is relative. So that's one of the issues that we may have to attend to, but may not really be serious on the continent at the moment. Okay, let's see um, the historicity of Adam. You know, in the West, that may be an issue. Uh, like uh, William Craig, I, I heard from him last year, saying um, the creation story in Genesis is, he called it mytho-history. So it's a combination of myth and history. So that is an issue over there, but here, nobody will stand up in the church on Sunday and say, Pastor, I don't think um, this Adam and Eve thing, you know, is correct. Average African person had been indoctrinated that the first man was, I mean, it was Adam or is Adam, so we don't have issue with that as such. Then, inspiration and the infallibility of the Bible and etc. So, this may not be serious issues on the continent, but let's see some of the issues that we may have to deal with on the continent of Africa. Now, here we go. Spirits and demons. Africans believe in the existence of spirits and demons. And some of you, 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 are, you, you can bear me witness to that. Perhaps you are coming, you prepare for this program, and then maybe right on the way, your car broke down on the road, and then you're like, the devil is a liar. I bind the devil in the name of Jesus. Because there is something that tells us that demons and spirit are always all after us to stop our good, you know, you know motive or, or thought. So we have this to, to deal with, issues that we deal with on the continent. We believe in the, pres in the existence of spirit and demons. We believe in idols. And the Africans believe in participation in community and family activities that involves animism. Animism seems to be an issue in Africa as well because of, though I won't subscribe to those who believe that African religion is animistic, no. Though it may have animistic elements in it, but animism is not our religion. Now what is animism? Simply put, it's just a belief that everything has its own soul. Everything has its own soul, everything has its own spirit. And we see that in the church sometimes, offering time, blessing time, bring out your offering, speak to your offering, and begin to speak to our offering. Why should you speak to your offering? What is in money that you are speaking to? That is an animistic concept in the church. Send your offering a message. For what? We speak to God, not to our offering. But in African traditional religion, when you go to the Babalawos of those days, the, 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 the Ifa priest, and, they will, and you want to consult the oracles, they will give you, they will say, okay, bring out money and talk to with their, uh, their couples and things like that, the crystal ball, okay, talk to your money and then they will talk and they, so we brought that into the church and it's right among us. So it's, it's an issue in Africa then. We also have um, ancestral worship or ancestral veneration. We still believe that the spirit of our ancestors don't leave us. An African will still pray, Ori Yami, my, the, the head of my father, please don't leave me alone. Your deceased father. So because we believe that the spirit of our ancestors are always around, they don't leave us. Whether consciously or unconsciously, we, we cannot believe in such things. So that is a problem that we need to, you know, deal with. Reincarnation. I think that is fading out on the continent of Africa, maybe because of knowledge. 
Although it's not generally accepted, in some part of Africa, some people don't believe in reincarnation. Like the Maasai group in the East Africa, they are semi-nomadic group. They don't believe that there is a life after death. So the thought of reincarnation doesn't even come to their mind. But in the West here, yeah, Western part of Africa, we believe in reincarnation. Some people have said, yes, I saw that man that died many years ago somewhere and things like that. You know, so these are issues that are common among us, amulet and charms. Then, yes, we have poverty, insecurity, terrorism, diseases, injustice, tribal conflicts, social tension, corruption, abduction, and other social vices. These are problems that are confronting the continent of Africa. So the first thing that comes to mind when you engage somebody with the truth of Christianity, when you tell them about Jesus Christ, the first thing that comes to the mind is, what would Jesus do to better my life? I have demons and spirits to, to face, to confront. They've stopped my business. They stopped my marriage. They are troubling me. With the Jesus you are trying to offer, give me victory over spirits and demons. Some families still pour librations on their family idols. Because typical of Africans, Africans do not, um, like I said, we don't think conceptually. We think concretely. So for Africans, they see themselves to be uh, too human to go to God in heaven. So they need an intermediary or divinities between them and God. So that is why almost in every, in every village, you see shrine, family shrine, family idols, and things like that. And some people, you still find that in, in Christianity, in, in the church, some people still do their African thing, their family thing. You know, during some festival, they still go back home and uh, or they send their own contribution for the family to work to to appease the family goals and things like that so these are issues so we also have issues with uh, animism and stressful worship and other things like that poverty in insurgency and things like that so when we you know present jesus christ or christianity to them the first thing that comes to the mind of an african is would jesus help me to alleviate my poverty will he provide security what would jesus offer me what does he have to offer me? Like the police will say, what, what do you have in your hands? So a typical African, when you talk to him about Jesus, what does Jesus have to offer me? So these are the issues that we need to deal with when we engage in Christian apologetics on the continent of Africa. However, um, there are also some issues that are right in the church. And that will be interesting because vast majority of us here are pastors, leaders in the church. And the first is syncretism. Syncretism is the amalgamation of other religious elements with Christianity. You know, trying to bring, you know, we bring forward some of the things in African traditional religion or Islam, and we amalgamate the whole thing together. And if that exists for over a long period of time, you may lose sight of the true content of Christianity itself. Hello? So, you may lose sight of true content of Christianity itself. So, it's an issue that we need to, to deal with. It brings Christianity into a synthesis with something totally alien to it. That is syncretism. But we have them in the church. We have some things that, like the first one I, I, I cited the other time, people talking to their offerings. It's from somewhere, from African traditional religion. So we have some of these things that people practice. Also, we also have right in the church, Simony. Simony is named after Magnus Simon in Acts of the Apostle. You remember when Peter ministered to the, to the Samarians and they, he saw the move of God and he offered money for the anointing, isn't it? Now we have that in the church today. This is the act of selling church offices and roles or sacred things. In the church today, we have the seat of glory, isn't it? And people pay for the seat of glory. People pay for anointed handkerchief, anointing oil. I've been to a meeting where people sell anointing oil, anointed handkerchief, and things like that. And they, they you know, right? I think there's a church in Abuja that I saw there. They have a um, pool of Bethsaida. People have to come and take a bit there for their healing for 50,000 naira in Abuja. Wow, it's, 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 it's happening in Africa. So it's a problem. Simon is a problem. Sometimes when we pay those spiritual things, you know, you know, for money. 
That's a problem. The another problem is courtism on the continent of Africa. Courtism, what is courtism? Courtism is or a court is a pseudo-Christian group which classifies itself as Christian but offers a different kind of gospel. You know, whatever that is contrary to the orthodox teaching of the church, any deviation from the essentials of Christianity, you know, may slip into courtism. So whenever we deviate from the orthodox teaching of the church or from the essentials of Christianity, uh, such a group, we are qualified to call them courts. You know, some of such, we have uh, people that say Jesus Christ is the same as Archangel Michael. That's Jehovah's Witnesses, isn't it? Uh, some will say uh, the Holy Spirit is just, a, is just an active force. It's not a person. These are essentials of Christianity that we need to actually deal with. But, you know, they, they, they deviate from, you know, essential Christianity. And the teacher to get to it was emotional. What do you believe? So we should, when we engage in Christian apologetics, these questions are very important. The next question is, what is your authority for what you believe? For some people, the authority is their feeling. Some people, the authority are sciences. Some, you know, some people, you know, some big names right there. So then the next question is, what are the implications if you were to live out your beliefs consistently over time? If you say you're an atheist, the next question is, do you think you can survive as an atheist in a world without God? Because if there is no God, there is anarchy. If there is no God, there is no sense of judgment, no sense of retribution, no sense of reward. So I can feel like I don't like your face and I gun you down. Nobody takes me for that. Nobody picks me up for that. So can an atheist live in a world that is trying to create himself, a world that is without God? So we're asking them the question, what are the implications if you were to live out your beliefs consistently over time? So, having considered these questions, I'm going to propose three things as a solution to some of these problems I've highlighted that we have to confront or deal with on the continent of Africa. The first one is the presentation of the gospel in all its fullness and depth. One of the ways we can deal with some of this problem, the problem of plutolatry, courtism, syncretism, you know, animism in the church, uh, idolatry, spirit and demons, is that we must present the gospel in all its fullness and depth. How are we going to do that? We must teach the sufficiency of scripture. The Bible is the magna carta of our faith. 
The Bible doesn't just become the word of God when it ministers to you. The Bible doesn't just contain the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. And that is where we should draw authority. Not from our culture. Not from some men. Not from revelation and visions and, and dreams. We draw our authority from the scripture. Therefore, our emphasis should be, first of all, the sufficiency of scripture. The Bible is sufficient. So whatever we need to learn about God, about man, about demons, spirits, how to deal with them, about heaven and hell, everything we can get from the scripture. Don't go outside that. Number two, I propose that we should teach the supremacy of Christ. Jesus is supreme to all. There are idols and demons that people worship in Africa, but most certain that Jesus is supreme to idols and demons. Is the way to God. It's not just one of the ways. It's supreme to them. He is God's exegesis. God has been trying to explain himself to Old Testament saints and they won't understand. So Jesus Christ, when he came, he came to reveal God to us. Hebrews chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. In sundry time, God spoke to our fathers through different means. But in this last day, he has spoken through his son, who is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his person. So Jesus is God's exegesis. So if you teach the supremacy of Christ, teach that his death, his resurrection, they are sufficient enough to deal with sin problem, to deal with the problem of evil, to deal with whatever we want to call it. So the sufficiency of Christ or the supremacy of Christ should be taught in our apologetic uh, task. The number three, the third thing I'm going to also uh, propose is that we should teach the solidarity of Jesus with his people. Africans have solidarity with Jesus in their suffering. Remember I told us that Africa has been ravaged with poverty, sickness, insurgency, and whatever like that. But please teach them that Jesus has solidarity with them. Acts chapter 9 verse 4, when Jesus accosted Paul on his way to Damascus, remember what he told Paul? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Oh, but Saul was actually persecuting Jesus' people, right? But Jesus said, when my people suffer, I suffer with them. So this is what we should push to Africans, that you are not alone in your suffering. The Bible calls Jesus Christ a man that is acquainted with grief and sorrow. So when we suffer, he suffers with us. You are not all alone in your suffering, whatever you are going through, whatever you have experienced in life. You must, Jesus Christ, have solidarity with you and we must teach that. Then I propose discipleship. Then African, I, mean, I also propose Christian apologetics education. We are repeating that. We must, you know, equip ourselves to defend the Christian faith. Now, let me go to the last thing. Um, caution. This is where I'm going to stop. Do I have other things? But let me just stop here. Caution. We must avoid the temptation to direct our apologetic task toward a cognitive end without paying attention to the affective implication of our task as defenders of faith. In other words, we often think of apologetics in terms of intellectual arguments, defending premises, analyzing presuppositions and worldviews, but we need to pay more attention to its affective impact. Without disparaging the role of the intellect, we must learn to connect the head with the heart. In other words, don't just be concerned about, you know, bogging them with information, trying to show intellectual superiority over some people. You know, apologetics is not about bullying simpler minds with our self-opinionated dogmatism. That's not, it's not about bullying people, trying to tell them how skillful and how intelligent we are. But we said we must ensure that we get into the heart of the people. The intellect is important for persuading men to believe, but God works through the heart. If our apologetic endeavor must bring about social, cultural, and moral transformation, we must speak to people's hearts through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. So the place I'm going to stop, in all of this, you may have read so much, you may have so much answers to give 
to those who are asking questions about Christianity, but we must understand that the Holy Spirit is the one that opened up the heart of the men to receive the gospel. What is the need of light to a blind person? Flood this room with light and bring a blind man into this place. He won't still see all the same. Because his problem is not light. His problem is sight. You may come with light, the light of the gospel, but you need to depend on the Holy Spirit to give them sight so that they can see. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 4, he said, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We therefore need the Holy Spirit to help remove the veil from their hearts so they can see. Thank you very much. God bless you. Yeah. Thank you. That's a wonderful presentation, um, Pastor Ebenezer. We can clap for him one more time. Thank you very much. Yeah. So if you have a question, um, this is what we'll do before I call the next um, um, person to come up. You can write your question down because we may not have that an opportunity for you to stand up and always come up. And please, for those of us at the back, let's, let's move forward. Let's come forward to the front seat. Let's move forward at least so that... Um, the camera will be able to capture everyone. As Pastor Beniza was talking, something comes to my mind. Praise God. That, you know, we are all African. And this is where we are. But this is our place. So, I'm going to put that in my question and later. So, it's just troubling my heart that, oh, oh. So, now we cannot pray again that the week I'm going into, that week, the angel that works in the week must prosper on my life, you know, all those kind of things. So I pray God help us in Jesus' name. So I'll be calling uh, our brother, F- we call him FSP. So Fati Okoduro. Let me say that in English. Fati Okoduro is the Yoruba word, and the English is um, an authentic um, word or a word of fat. That's what he does in that program. He uses Yoruba in language that is. Anytime a Muslim is coming into the program, you are not coming to say just to say something and go scot free. There, this is life. Whatever you say, immediately is going to help you display the information on the screen. So if you are lying, if you say you don't have evidence, it's going to tell you, don't worry, everything you need is here. It will display it. So if you are coming to say something, you must have prepared yourself ahead that you have the facts, you have factual evidence of what you are talking about. So I will be calling Brother Folar and Sunday Peter to come up. Thank you, sir. Christian apologetics, a wake-up call to the church. This period we are is a period where people are yearning for answers. This period we are is a period where people are asking questions. They want to know more. It's not a time people just sit down and you teach them, you lecture them and and they go home without asking questions. This time we are, 21st century, people want to know. Okay. People want to know, the, as I write as in my introduction, the, the period we are is a time people are sparring for answers. Time people wanted to know. The people want, wanted to have corresponding reasons for their actions. You said, accept Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Why must I, why should I accept Jesus as my Savior? They wanted to know. It has gone beyond Wagba, 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 just to say you're a wacky story. Wagba, it has gone beyond that. People want to know why do I need to accept that Jesus you are promoting? Why are you sweating? 
Why are you clapping? Why are you dancing in the rain? People want to know the reason why you are doing this. This is the period. Yeah. They want to know why you are giving them certain instruction to be performed. As the Yoruba day says, Ajayi wo yi, lo mo, e wo roi wo yi to. I don't know how to say that in English. Dog of this era should know as that's key to hunt down the hairs of this present period. I, I, maybe I got it right. You can judge me. <laughs> People want to know before they accept Jesus Christ, they want to know why and how they will accept Jesus Christ. There is yearning and crying in and out of Africa, churches today, for the reason of our faith. Muslims are asking questions. Atheists are asking questions. Why are you gathering here? Why are you a Christian? Why are you going to church on Sundays? If the church fails to give answers to these questions, there will be avalanche of people turning back to the church. The church that once fed them, the church that once, the church that once introduced the redemption of Jesus to them, they will turn their back. They will turn that church to mere gathering where people relax and flex their muscles. If we fail to answer this question, the church where our fathers have gathered, where the messages of Jesus has been preached, we soon turn to a gathering where people do jamborees. The Pentecostal pastor, I call them Pentecostals, the modern day evangelists, they have been spreading churchianity instead of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have been, they have been spreading false teaching across the length and breadth of Africa. They are giving false hope to people instead of preaching the everlasting gospel of salvation to the people. The atrocities within the folk who label themselves ambassadors and mouthpiece of Christ has given chance for the devil to creep into the fold and take away the sheep while the fold scatter and wander abroad. Thank God for Brother Peter. Peter was so close to Jesus. He won't let Jesus breathe. On several occasions, he was seen asking questions about the details and cause of his teachings. Peter is a type of 21st century Christian who goes about wanting to know more as he probes deeply into issues and diggers content from their sources by asking thought-provoking questions. John 21, 21, Mark 10, 28. John 6, 68, and several verses of the scripture. Peter, you will see Peter asking, Jesus, why do you say this? Jesus, was, what is the meaning of this proverb? Jesus, why do you say this? G Peter was the one asking questions. Peter was like 21st century person asking Jesus about issues. Only apologetics can answer the questions. If the apologists fail in their duties to stand up to the task, what is his task? Muslims are asking questions. Atheists are asking questions. People, even in the church, the church members are asking serious questions. If Christian apologists fail in this task, if we Christian carelessly play around this quest and refuse to provide adequate and scriptural answer to these questions, marauding the heart of people today. You see, our meeting place our auditorium, our cathedral, our gigantic building, our mansions will soon turn out to be a gathering for Muslims, atheists, and agnostics if we fail. If our youths and young ones are well equipped with biblical answers, they will go all out in their youthful strength, expending their energies only for the gospel of Christ. Ecclesiastes 12 1. However, if you fail in rising to the facing, in facing the challenges before us, the African church and the entire world by extension is only sitting on a gun of uh, on a keg of gunpowder, waiting and ticking for a time to explode. The, te this, the teaching is a charge, a awakening call to Christians to their duty in defending the gospel as spoken by Peter in 1 Peter 3.15, as our dear pastor has rightly quoted. And um, 
Philippians 1.17, Brother Paul was saying, talking about apologetics. Now, as I will rush here, definition of tongues, we know the church. The church is call out people, ecclesia. People call out from darkness into the light of the Son of God. Yeah, that is, that is the definition of church. We see that Matthew 16, 16 to 18. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail. Colossians 1, 13 and 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That is the church. Apologetics, as it has been explained for us earlier by the, by the earlier speaker, apologia, defending the gospel, providing answers to the question that are being asked. 1 Peter 3, 15. Wake up call is an action to is, is, is a call to action that will spring up immediately when we give answers to the probing art, like it happened to the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. What happened to those two disciples will happen to the art of our youth when we give them right answers. The, look in, in Luke 24 32. They said, are our heart not burning within us when he was talking to us? When Jesus was dishing out, giving an explanation about events, about events, about prophecies, about the Messiahs. Jesus, on, on their way going to Emmaus, Jesus broke the thing down for them. He broke it down to them. That Don't you know about the Messiah that was written about in the, in, 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 in the, by the prophet? You don't know the Messiah will die and will resurrect the third day. Don't you know? And when Jesus disappeared, they said, wow, we never knew he was the one. Little, no wonder. Our heart was burning within us while he was talking to us. If we give right answers to our youth, if we give right answer to our children, if we give right answer, biblical answer to the church members, they will be yearning to do evangelism. They will be yearning to go all out in their strength. I learned about some people. They went out for evangelism. At the end of the day, it was an atheist that converted them to an atheism. Because they were not equipped with questions. They, they asked them a series of questions they would not be able to answer. Why is Jesus God? What is the meaning of Trinity? Is the Bible word of God? What do you mean by eternity? These are questions that are being asked by people that are going out for evangelism. And if they are not equipped, there will be a problem. Why apologetics? The eating are raging. They are planning to break our unity. The unbelievers are planning to come into the church, break the church, turn the church to an Islamic world, turn the church to a museum. That is their plan. That is why we need that apolog apologetics. That is why we need it. The Eden, the unbelievers are planning to come into They are not happy seeing the gathering of the children of God. Devil is not happy. Satan is not happy. People of the world are not happy seeing people gathering together. They want to come in, scatter the food, and turn it into a museum. That is why we need apologetics. Psalm 2, verse 1 to 4. The hidden are raging. They are, they are engrossly, they, 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 they are embittered. They want to come in, break our unity, and turn the church into another thing years. Secondly, why we need apologetics? The art of man is yearning for answer. Old men wanting to know. Young ones wanted to know. Adults wanted to know. Married ones wanted to know. Their hearts are yearning. Don't forget Daniel chapter 2 verse 14. It said, in the last days, knowledge will be more. There will be craving for knowledge. People want to know. People want to know. It's, it has gone. The time of in the past has gone that people don't want to ask questions. Now, you see people asking questions. That is why we need apologetics. And it will provide right answers to our people. The enemies of, the, of Christ, the enemy of Christ will come like a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. They will be deceiving young ones, deceiving women. If they are not well equipped, soon or, sooner or later you see your church member becoming another thing. You see your church member becoming what you are not expecting them to become. That is why we need an apologetics as Christians. Apologetics will silence false teachings and gospel alien to the body of Christ. 
and thereby allowing the church to grow. Apologetics will allow the church to grow. When you silence false teachings, when you silence alien doctrine, when you silence Muslims, when you silence it is when you silence agnostic, the church will grow and the gate of hell will not prevail. As Brapo said in Philippians 1 17, I quoted In Africa, we have seen demonstration of power in the time of Babalola, in the time of Prophet Obadari, and the likes, and so many great men in Dausa. We've seen power, we've seen dead men coming to life. People want to know why do I need to Jesus? Don't tell them Jesus can do miracle. It, it has gone far, far beyond that. Today, Abalis do magic. Today, we see people perform like in the time of Moses, when Moses was sent to Pharaoh, he performed some miracle, and the Pharaoh magician performed the same thing, almost the same thing. They never let them go until they saw the fingers of God. He said, this is the finger of God. They have to let them go. Remember Jesus in John chapter 8, while he was he wanted to judge that um, adulterous woman, he was writing on the floor, on the ground with his finger. We don't know what he was writing. He was writing. And he asked them, if, you have, if the person that has not seen should cast the first stone, one after the other, they fled. Yoruba mani won fen yile. They fled one after another. Stylishly, they went away. We need somebody that can write, that can die, that can dispense the gospel rightly, teaching our people, teaching them the right gospel, so that the church will proceed, the church will progress. How can we wake up? How can we wake up? The church needs to create a unit. This is an advice for the church. If you are listening as pastor, general overseers, the church needs to create a unit that involves answering questions apologetically in the children and youth gatherings. If we want to proceed as Christians in this era, excuse me, we need units in our churches where questions will be answered by the children, by our youth. A unit should be organized for them. If you have this question, go to this unit get your answers. We should not neglect that. By doing that, the church will progress. We should organize seminars like this that we are doing. The church should organize seminars like this where issues relating to the faith will be trashed and dealt with biblically. Another point we can do. We should train and retrain our evangelists the evangelists that want to go and evangelize, if they are not trained in answering questions, they will be evangelized into idolatry. The evangelists, people that want to go out for evangelism, they should be trained and retrained. They should come to seminar like this where they get trained. They should read books. Support and sponsor to those having the skill and they should push them forward to answer critics. Some people have special gifts. Some people have gifts in debate. They have oratory skill. They can talk much. Not, not, not everybody can speak. Some people can write. In every area, in every aspect we are good at, let us sponsor them as church. If you can write, let him write books defending the gospel. If you can speak, let him speak, debate. Let him organize debate. Let them organize symposium, seminars for the people. We should spend much on equipping our libraries with apologetic tools rather than building mansions. Let me say, say this. Our churches are building mansions. We are proliferating branches. Let me prophesy as the prophet will do. I, I am standing on the pedestal of prophecy. Sooner or later, a day is coming. All these churches will be banned. Nobody will come and worship again in Nigeria. It's getting to that gradually. If we are not training our church members, if we are spending all our money in building gigantic mansion, the, go to Turkey. The gigantic mansion has been turned to a Muslim worship center. Nigeria is going gradually tending towards that era. If you are not careful, train your church member. Don't let 
building mansion be our focus. Build men for Christ. Build church member for Jesus. Wherever they are, they will be an ambassador of Christ. Either we are gathered or we are not gathered. Either COVID-19 or not. We are ambassadors of Christ and the gospel of Christ will be spread across. Spread it across. So pastors, if you are listening to me, stop building mansions. Build your church member. Train them, teach them about the gospel. How many minutes? Five. Thank you. We should, as I said, we should stop competitive proliferation. Ah, so so church had 80, 80 branches. Now, me, I must also have 80 branches. Who told you? Train your church member. Teach them how to answer questions. Teach them biblical teachings, not what our brother just finished. We should stop proliferating churches, mansions. Instead of that, let's spend our money in programs like this. We have our great churches in Nigeria. You can imagine if such a garden is used for a purpose like this, and you, you go out to evangelize, and I go out to evangelize, and somebody is asking, is this the son of God? You know the rest right answers to give, and your evangelism will be effective. With apologetics, evangelism will be more effective. The church should learn how to speak up when we notice any of our Christian critics talking in of our faith. Many Muslims will come out and say, Jesus is not God. And the pastor will keep quiet. They go on radio, they go on social media, they say, Jesus is not son of God. Bible is not word of God. And you are there. Some Muslim will organize program beside the church. They be challenging the church like Goliath. Say, come out. If you are a pastor here, can you defend the gospel? Come and defend it. Bible is not word of God. Jesus is not God. There is nothing like Trinity. No pastor will come out. The pastor should come out. Talk. He's not coming out to fight. He's not coming out to struggle, to cause melee, to cause kofu. No. We are coming out to give answers to their questions. Yeah. Again, another thing we should do is we should sponsor programs like this on radio programs where we answer biblical questions on radio, on television, on our social media platform instead of spreading erratic teachings on our social media platform, share programs like this. In conclusion, after this seminar, every participant should have the desire in them to know more about the gospel of Jesus. We should leave that past where we say, Wagba, Wagba, Jesus, why must I say Jesus? You should know. We should leave that area of teaching. We should go on to perfection. After this seminar, every participant should have the desire in them to know more about the gospel of Jesus. They should know how to answer questions of their faith and how the knowledge can be shared across in our churches. If you have the knowledge, learn how to share it across with your wife, with your younger ones, with the, with the youth unit, with the women wing, men wing. We should spread the knowledge across. God help in us. The church need to imbibe apologetics and uh, we need to imbibe apologetics into our programs. While we are doing Sunday school, while we are doing youth program, one hour is not too much to do question and answer session on biblical teachings on who is Jesus, what is Holy Spirit, who is Holy Spirit, where how do we get the Bible? Some I saw one article. Somebody was spreading it. And every Bible is demonic. It was from Satan. I said, Wow, why are you coming? It was being spreaded almost every year. You, you might have come across it because the real teachings is the real truth is not being fed by our church members. And failure to do this, we are done for. The church is done for if you fail in doing apologetics. Summary. The church is the call out people. We are called out to show the people of the world the danger of darkness. That is why we are called out. We are called out to show the people in the world the danger of darkness. That is eternal damnation. That is separation from our almighty God. That is why we are called. We are to show the danger of darkness in which we, they are living and we should present the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, thereby helping them 
to get transported into the kingdom of the Son of God. We are called out and we are to help others to get out from that position as well. However, the church, the church, before doing this, need to wake up from their slumber. The church need to wake up from their slumber. Before you can do apologetics, you need to wake up yourself. We need to wake up from all these heretic teachings our brother just mentioned, our pastor just mentioned. Wake up from there, reform the church, reform our teachings, and we go back to the Bible, back to the Bible. Then we can dish out our knowledge to the unbelievers. Before this, we need to wake up from our slumber and keep our members on how to answer this question of the critics, thereby making the growth of the church organically driven and not mechanical, as we are seeing today. We are doing mechanical spreading. But when the church, in, when Peter preached, 3,000 converts was added to the church without forcing them. Today, people force people. They lure people to the church by, with gifts, with sweet words, with quotation, motivational things. No. We, when you preach direct word of God, right teaching of Jesus Christ, people will voluntarily give their life to Jesus. You see people saying, Pastor, come to our location, we have a fellowship. Come and teach us about the word of God. That is when they have the right word. Christ, thereby making the growth of the church organically driven and not mechanical as we are seeing today. Remember, growth of the body of Christ is not in mansion. The growth of the body of Christ is not in how many mansions we have built. 100,000 capacity. 1 million. No, no, no. That is not the growth of Christ. It is not in cathedral or in numbers of worshippers. I have 500,000 worshippers at the time. No, that is not the growth of church. As we are seeing today, many people are claiming. Remember, the growth of the body of Christ is not in mansion, cathedral, or in number of worshippers, but of our understanding of the scripture thereby dividing the world accurately and getting more souls into the kingdom of Christ. Can you imagine if somebody who is well versed in answering questions go out all out for evangelism and Muslims are asking questions and he was he is able to answer all the question. What happened to that Muslim? He has no choice than to give his life to Jesus. But if you go all out to preach the gospel and without Somebody is asking questions. Say, let us go. This person is only asking questions. We, let's leave the person. I've listened to so many audios of Muslims when they hijack messages of evangelists in the buses. If an evangelist is preaching the ghost in the bus. And an Afar, a Muslim, was asking questions. I have a question. And the evangelist said, I am not here to answer questions. Let's unland it up. Let me pray for you. And after the evangelists had kept quiet, the Muslim will not stand up and began to preach Islam for the people. That is the end. So, the scripture thereby dividing the world accurately and getting more soul to the kingdom of Christ and closing the door to those who are almost at the edge of crossing boundary or leaving the faith. Let me share these two testimonies before I leave the podium. Two, somebody coming from China. I've shared it online. The brother might even be listening to us. He said he was a Christian while he was in Nigeria, trained in the way of the Lord. But after listening to Akadip, Muslim polemist, they trashed the scripture. They turned the scripture to shred. Bible is nothing to him again. He said anytime he wanted to pick the Bible to read, he would remember what Adekwadu said about Bible. He said this Bible, Bible that talks about sex, that talks about the breast of women. He would just drop it again. That week, he was almost taking shahada. Shahada is confession of faith in Islamic way. He now came across my, convert, uh, my engagement with that same Afar. He sat and said, hey, this same Afar is the one this brother is engaging. The, brother, the Afar was standing up, sitting down, sweating, cleaning his faces all the way. He said, wow, ah, if this is Islam, I will not join the religion. The brother called me from China and said, thank you, thank God for you engaging the Muslim Christ. I will have become a Muslim. Now, I know the Christian faith is the true way. Now, the brother is in Christ. He's still serving the Lord Jesus. Another person, a pastor wife, the sister might even be listening to us now. She said she has listened to all these Muslim polemics and her faith was dwindling. 
She was pastor's wife, but she was only going to church with her body. Her spirit is almost living. Thank you. Now, after listening to our messages, after engaging, seeing our engagement with Muslim, the woman said, now she is back on her feet. She is even now engaging Muslims, engaging them, answering their question. This is a wake-up call. We have no choice than to go for apologetics in our churches. Churches, I'm, I'm admonishing, I'm calling you out. Instead of wasting money in, 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 in jamborees, in, out, in programs that is not fulfilling the gospel, let us spend our money, let us spend our time in ditching out, in helping, in doing apologetic words. God help us in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you, sir. Oh, so we are going straight forward because of our time. So we are going into the question and answer section. So that's the next thing on our list now. So I don't know if we have any question. Please, just like I said, you have a question, sir. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. We have two people. Three. Four. Any other person? All right. Thank you. So we have a question online as well. So this is what we'll do. You put a question down so we can give it to the speakers to look into the question and answer because we want to make sure we round up by 12 at least. So, but there is a question online by, I mean, one. So, there is, we have a question online. The question is, if I am asked, how do I know the Bible is true? What would my answer be? That has been challenged, Ask a question. Actually, he gave an explanation on that. But the summary of the explanation is that Bible is just like a book. Anybody can come up and say, I have my own religion, this is my book. But what is the assurance, what evidence do I have that this is actually a true book from God? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. So we have um, Pastor here. The question is, how do we know that the Bible is true? There would be three things. First thing is internal evidence. We start with internal evidence because, like, for instance, Luke. Luke went around and interviewed people to write about the life of Christ. Peter was a witness of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And... There were 500 people who saw Jesus at one time after his resurrection. So you have eyewitnesses that saw him. Thomas touched him. So we look for internal evidence of eyewitnesses, historical accounts, and so forth. Now, the question may be, well, how do we know that that is accurate? <clears throat> Here's something. Well, let me go secondly. I won't get into that. The second thing is external evidence. External evidence. And one of the presentations that I do, I give many quotations of historical writers. One famous one that many people have heard of is Josephus. But there are many, many other historians that lived around the time of Christ that write stories in secular history about Jesus and about his followers. And when you put all of those external statements, not biblical statements, but historical statements, other historians, you can put those together and they tell the story of, of uh, the Messiah, his crucifixion and resurrection. Those are external sources, sources outside of Scripture. There's a third one, and that's what we would call manuscript evidence. And the way that that works is you can take any historical document, and usually what is used is some of the ancient Greek documents like the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, and so forth. And these are seen as being authentic and authoritative and yet, when you go back and look at the manuscript evidence, the earliest one that we have is about 170 to 180 years after Homer wrote the Iliad, and yet we consider that as being authoritative. 
we have manuscripts of the New Testament that go back just maybe 40, 50 years after the original was written. And so if Homer's Iliad would be seen as being authoritative using this manuscript dating method, the New Testament would be even more authoritative than also the amount of manuscripts. You can look at some of these ancient man Greek manuscripts and you may have several hundred copies or fragments. When you look at the number of copies or fragments you have of the New Testament, there are thousands upon thousands. And so whatever test you want to give to show that an, that an old document is authoritative, the New Testament goes far beyond any other manuscripts or old ancient documents as far as being authoritative. Then you would talk about the Old Testament, I'll just do this quickly, that if the New Testament is authoritative, throughout the New Testament, the Old Testament is quoted as being authoritative. So when you put manuscript, internal, external, manuscript evidence, the Bible and the New Testament goes far beyond any other historical document as being authoritative and trustworthy. Thank you very much, sir. Um, do we have any of the uh, presenter? You don't have anything to say to that? Okay, just like uh, two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, also, we can also, um, other evidences uh, that are external to the scripture to help us ascertain that the Bible is true, is inspired, is authentic. Uh, uh, from prof uh, fulfilled prophecies, rather. We see Jesus Christ, you know, a lot of prophecies in the Bible, and we see prof uh, fulfilled prophecies, so they are one of the evidences to show that the Bible is true in its claims. We also have archaeological, uh, you know, evidences as well. Archaeologists have been able to uncover some facts written in the Bible, and we see the, their existence. One of the most recent is the ossuary of James. You know, that was discovered in the archaeological market in uh, 2004. And uh, on the ossuary was written the ossuary of James, the brother of Jesus, the son of Joseph. You know, and though it went through several scrutiny and uh, at the end of the day, we were able to discover that that was actually, you know, the ossuary of James. So we have a lot of archaeological evidences, you know, to actually ascertain that. One more example. Some years ago, skeptics were looking for ground to discredit the Bible. And then... Um, they said, yes, right now we find an error with the Bible. So what is the error? They said, right in Daniel, Daniel claimed that uh, uh, Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon before Babylon was divided into mid and Persian kingdom. So, but according to the secular history of the Babylonians, they said Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon before it was divided into mid and Persian kingdom. So that is an issue because you know, the skeptic said, the Christians cannot know the history of the Babylonians more than the Babylonians themselves. So something must be wrong somewhere. So we've actually found a mistake with the Bible. So Bible scholars started researching and we, together with the help of the archaeologists, discovered that, wow, uh, the Bible is actually right. Daniel was correct in his claim that Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. And also, uh, the Babylonian history is also correct to have said that Nabonidus was the last king. Oh, that is strange. According to the law of non-contradiction by Norman Geisler, he said something cannot be true and wrong at the same time. So, so how do we actually reconcile this? As far as Daniel was concerned, the person he knew as the king was Belshazzar. However, Belshazzar was a grandson of Nabonidus, Nabonidus was the king of Babylon, but he went to exile without abdicating his kingship. So, but he left Belshazzar to, to, to be his regent. So, for Daniel, who I worked with is Belshazzar. But for Babylonian history, who was the king it was Nabonidus. So, that cleared the issue. So, we have archaeological history to actually tell us that the Bible is true. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that. Fatih Okoro, is there anything to say? Because of our time. All right. So, we, 
well, this is what we'll do because of our time. We're going to summarize some questions together. So I have this question here that how do we deal? So the question is meant for, it's a question for Pastor Steve and Pastor Afalabi. How do we deal with KJV only movements in the Bible interpretation? We have some set of people that believes KJV translation. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So we have some people that believe KJV translation Bible is the original Bible. So any other translation is counterfeit. So how can we deal with those people? And the second thing, the second question here for both um, speakers, sir. From what text is the native Bible in, <laughs> in Nigeria translated from? So I think Pastor Falabi will be able to answer here. Yes, from what text is the native Bible in Nigeria translated from? Is it the Greek or Hebrew texts? So, from where? We know the man that translated it, uh, Majai Crowder. So, <laughs> that, that wasn't so clear when we say native Bible in Nigeria. I don't understand native Bible in Nigeria. Uh, maybe, maybe it's talking about Yoruba version or, or yeah. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, uh, someone the Ajayi Crowder translated the Bible from English to Yoruba, right? And uh, I, I think I've heard the Bible he used to translate, I've, at least I've heard it before, is it's right there in Badagri. So you can go there and see, just have a feel of the Bible. So it's from, from what I saw when I went there, it was from KJV, actually. So, but that is not the issue. Uh, so that I don't take so much time, Steve is going to answer the first question, you know, KJV, why do we, why do we try to, or why, why are people saying other versions of the Bible should decide it or things like that. I'm not going to say so much on that. I did a video, go to my YouTube page, just Ebenezer for Labby TV on YouTube. I had a conversation with a Bible translator two years ago by the name Samuel Skiv, and they were dealt with such issue. The subject of our debate, of our conversation was making sense of the proliferation of the Bible translations. We have so many, how do we make sense of so many versions of the Bible? So I think that answers the question. So just, just go to my YouTube page and you can find answers to that. So Steve, over to you. When someone would ask me the question about the King James only debate. I practice one of the principles that I talked about. Ask them a question. So here's what the question that I would ask them. Or if, they, if you were the person and you said, Steve, King James is the right translation. I would ask them, explain to me why the King James translation is different than other translations. Do you know the difference? Do you know why? Do you know what the debate is all about? They don't. But here's, here's the debate. In the early centuries, as you know, they didn't have printing press. They didn't have photocopiers. Everything was done by hand. And there were two traditions that took up. There was a Western tradition where manuscripts went to the West. There were others that manuscripts went to the East. And so as those manuscripts were being copied generation after generation, there were slight differences that went to the East and the West. But no major doctrine was affected. No major doctrine was affected. And so I would just have that conversation with them to ask them why they believe the King James Version is, is uh, to be preferred or to be the only one used, what's wrong with the other translations, and make them start defending their view. Chances are they don't know. They have just been told that it's King James only. Uh, so that would, that's it. Also, let me just say one other thing that's important. This isn't about this specifically, but it doesn't enter in. You know, there are two types of translations. There's one that is more literal, 
There's one that's more thought by thought as opposed to word for word. Most of the translations are paraphrased thought for thought. And so we have to be careful to know what type of translation that we're reading. Let me give you an example of what happens. In Madagascar, well, first of all, in the Greek language, when, a, when a giving qualifications for an elder, bishop, pastor, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, it says, the husband of one wife. The Greek literally says a one-woman man. That's what the Greek says literally, a one-woman man. Many of our, most of our translations would then say the literal, the husband. The Malagasy translation says the pastor is supposed to be married. You see the problems when you start translating different versions into contemporary language, sometimes complete meanings are changed. So just be aware of what translation you're using, whether it's supposed to be literal, whether it comes from a literal translation, a paraphrase, a thought for thought, word for word, because that make, can make a, a big difference. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So uh, this is what we do. I'm going to summarize um, the whole of our questions because of our time together. So we have a question um, here, and I believe if you follow our speakers online, I believe most of this question has been um, answered. So there is a question that it look alike. So it is about how can we make apologetic relevant down to the grassroots in the next five years in our churches? So this is what I mean. We have, yeah, it's, it's like we have believers. We have some other believers as a Christian, but they don't believe in apologetic. They have their dogmatism, their practices. And when you try to explain what apologetic is all about, that or to correct their notion of some certain things, they get frustrated and get angry with you. So how can we do that? And also down to the grassroots of the church, how can we still make this apologetic relevant? So that's the question. Sir. Okay. Uh, in my book, Doing Apologetics with an African Mindset, I made mention of that, uh, apologetics to the grassroots. Um, uh, I would have loved to make mention of my denomination, what we have been doing, but don't let me make mention of that now. One of the ways you can make apologetics appealing to people in the grassroots is um, sometimes you may have to change the nomenclature, apologetics, when you are presenting it to them. I remember the first time I walked up to the man of God that gave us this facility. And I said, uh, sir, we have a conference. We'd like to use this facility. And uh, it was about what I said, apologize. He said, that sounds theological. So that is the first defense. That sounds theological. So some people were just like, just PM me of these theological things. I just want to be a Christian. So the simple thing we can do in our Sunday school, you know, simply just insert in one of your Sunday school lessons, who is Jesus? And you explain, what are you doing? You are doing apologetics. Who is the Holy Spirit? And you are trying to tell us in the Sunday school manual that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the eternal Godhead. That means to have established that you believe in Trinity. You believe that the Holy Spirit is a person. As I guess those who believe that it's just an active influence. Do you understand? So taking to the grassroots is introducing it even to our Sunday school curriculum, teaching in the Bible studies, and things like that. You may spare them of the big word, apologetics. Just saying, explaining the Bible. Making sense of the Bible. You can use such nomenclature. I think it's to go down well with them. Thank you. Just very quickly, I just want to say amen. That word, is very, that word is very confusing. That sounds like very academic. You've got to be in a university. You've got to be very intelligent. I can't even pronounce it. So don't use the word. Just challenge him with a question. Just, if, like he says, if somebody, if you get there, if somebody asks you how, they, how you know Jesus is God, 
What are you going to tell them? Don't tell them that you're practicing apologetics. Just apply it. Just apply it. Just apply it. Don't use the word. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a wonderful one. So this will be our last um, question. Actually, my question has been answered along the line. So, yeah. And I would advise us to also follow. Like I said, you can follow our, our speakers online. Most of the questions we are about to ask has been answered by them. So the question here is, um, what are the rules of our Christian praises and prayer in the apologetic? Singing songs of praise and also praying. What rules does it play in apologetic? And this person is asking a question relating to angel. Yeah, in apologetics. So, all right. So the, the second question, which will be the to just round up, is uh, is asking a question about angels that the Bible doesn't teach us, um, give us the creation of angels, but this can be actually found in uh, Islamic um, books, but we don't have it in our Bible. Okay, let's start with uh, uh how do we do apologetics in uh, Okay, true music. Okay, that's, that's very fine. That's, that's instructive. Um, one of the things, one of the ways we communicate our theology or theological persuasion are through songs and prayers. When I begin to hear your prayers, I know where you belong to. When I hear your song, I know where you belong to theologically. So one of the ways we can communicate that, I was, I was on my way to Ikurudu one day and uh, going to the seminary to lecture. And uh, I had a song in Yoruba on the streets and people were singing with all passion oh in other words jesus you have never failed don't start with me something is wrong with the theology of that person so jesus has the ability the potential to fail but don't let it start with me do you understand that so we can actually defend the christian faith by having the right content that portrays the gospel even in our songs the lyrics is very very important and that's why we even look into the lyrics of our hymns that we sing in church some hymns should not be sung in the church again do you understand some on a lighter mood on a lighter mood is the lily of the valley the brighter morning star nothing is wrong with it but the song came from songs of solomon but actually we call jesus christ the lily of the valley, the bread and morning star. But if you are reading Songs of Solomon, it was the, the groom that called his bride, the lily of the valley and the bread and morning star. In other words, Jesus would be the one telling his church, you are the lily of the valley and the... You understand that. But we understand that God understands our you know, faith more than our formulas. The formulas may be wrong, but sometimes God says, okay, okay, I understand it, but we should correct all of that. So our songs, our prayers reflect our theological persuasions. Now the last one. Uh, okay. Okay. Angels. Now we said, we talk about the sufficiency of the scripture. Everything that we need to know about God, our dealings with him, things that will take us to heaven, they are written in the Bible. So where the Bible have no mouth, I have no ears. Hear what I said. If the Bible is silent over 18, I can't hear what it's saying. So other angels, in their Uriel, in their Raphael, they are in the Apocrypha. And we don't subscribe to that. So but what we need to know from the scripture about God is dealings with us, how we are going to please him, how we get to heaven. They are all given to us in the Bible. Don't go any further. Thank you very much. Again, I just want to say amen to what brother is saying, but here's a warning. And I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this from the West, but I think that it's, the, it's going to be the true anywhere. Our young people are learning about God and Christianity by the songs they sing without even thinking about it. And we have Christian music groups in the U.S. who have a huge following of young people who are not singing truth. 
but they're great singers, they're great entertainers, they're great dancers. And our young people are hearing that and are mimicking it. But it's not truth. So make sure that the songs teach truth. Thank you very much. Let's let's jump our hands together for all the speakers. Yeah, it's, um, that's very wonderful. So we go to um, appreci appreciations of guests, as I call on Brother Hope for people. Praise the Lord. We want to appreciate our guests for the wonderful job they've done this morning, stroke afternoon. Thank you very much. We can't pay you. The Lord God Almighty will reward you. Hallelujah. So very briskly, I want to call on uh, our speaker all the way from the U.S. to come with our widow minds to pick this from me, uh, Pastor Steve. Let's put our hands together. Thank you very much. God is your reward. Praise the Lord. And um, I also want to call on our Pastor Afolabi to come forward to pick this from me. Let's put our hands together. The Lord is your reward. You have given us a lot of idea, knowledge. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And our Pastor Afolabi, please come and take this. Say, teacher. Hallelujah. The Lord will reward you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, everybody. We will come to a close of the program. All right. So we go into the vote of thanks, and after that, we have our pictures together, everyone. So. Oh, thank you very much, everybody, for being part of this conference. God bless you really good in Jesus' name. Uh, many of you came all the way from Ikorodu, part of Lagos. Um, Bishop, you know, thank you very much for coming. A lot of them, people from Life Seminary, my colleague at work, a lot of them came here today, and I believe that God has blessed us in one way or the other. So, I am, we are very grateful. Okay, so can we please rise up as we say the grace? Let's say the grace. Okay, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. And surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, the Lord bless you, Rigu. Shalom. So we can please. No, maybe we can do that outside. It's, it's one o'clock already, so we can do that outside. Thank you. God bless you.